Hello everyone, I'm Paul, also known as Rorschach on the forums, and this is a walkthrough of Sword of the Stars 2. In this video I'll be covering how to run your empire, specifically I'm talking about managing the economics and the government uh, parts of the game. I'll start with the macro empire level, but I'll also dig into the individual colony management. So let's get started. So I've got a basic game set up here. Again, I recommend if you're new to Sword of the Stars 2 that you start out with the Tarkas. Um, they're an easy to use race. They're very um, standardized in terms of FTL, economics, and management. Um, some of these other guys, specifically the, the Horde and the Loa, are very, very different. So uh, you want to be careful looking at uh, starting out with these guys unless you've gone through a couple of games to begin with. So let's get started. So you can see down here, this has been 67 turns into this particular game, and I'm running on the trifecta map, which is split into these kind of four clusters. So I've got this arm down here, uh, it looks like the horde has this top cluster, and the lower are across from me. So it gives me an opportunity to do a lot of growth. I've just run into the inheritors, and just met up with them a couple turns ago. So it's allowed me to really kind of develop, spent the last 67 turns really with the first two X's, the explore and the expand. Um, so I've been able to build up a lot of infrastructure and hopefully be able to show that off to you guys. Um, so up here in the upper left hand corner, this is the empire management panel that you've got here. In fact, if we click away from that, you see this is this shows our entire empire management. I uh, went over a lot of that in the star map or the strategic screen. What we're specifically looking at here is right here where the treasury, this is the amount of savings credits that you have in the bank. Um, this right here is the empire budget summary. Uh, which we'll go into a lot of detail, and then at the macro level, this broadly adjusts the balance between research and government. But in order to really dig into the economics of your empire, you need to click on the uh, budget summary, and that'll take you to the empire management screen. Um, I like what the guys have done with this, uh, guys and gals have done with this, uh, with the updates here. So there's a lot more information that we've seen previously, and I'll, I'll break it down one by one. So up here, you've got your budget summary, and I'll kind of show you how this relates. This basically shows 100% of your current income for the turn, which is listed up here. So I'm currently at a little over 1.6 million income total, and how it's going to be split up. The two that you see right Right off the bat are savings, which is the green wedge, um, combined with stimulus, which is gold, and security, which is gray, covers that side. Um, the maintenance, including fleet and station maintenance, are this darker kind of blue. And then the purple is the actual research that I've got going on right here. So I'm working on heavy platforms, and it's estimated 14 turns at the current um, amount that I'm doing. So. Once you kind of break that down, so you've got your ongoing expenses to run your empire is along the top here. So the security allows you to um, gain points to run intelligence and counterintelligence missions, so that's how you can break it down here. But there's a little marker right here. If you go below this marker, and you notice this black wedge starts growing on your on your budget summary and you notice that you start increasing corruption down here so you have to keep a minimum level of security on your colonies or within your empire in order to avoid that corruption and really kind of save yourself some money in the long term there's some edge cases where you'd want to reduce security down below that um, but you're really kind of starting to throw away money uh, once you start getting into higher levels of corruption. So a lot of times you just want to stick it to the point and kind of keep it there. Balancing intel versus counter intel, that really gets into the uh, intelligence game. Um, stimulus over here, I'll probably dig into that a little bit more when I talk about trade and mining and colonization. Um, but really what this does is this is kind of the um, money that you spend to invest in the in the private sector, right? So uh, not the empire-driven colonization, mining, and freighter trade ships, but doing the bureaucracy and pumping money into the into the private sector to get them to do it for you. And there's some advantages to that when I dig into mining and trade um, th that I'll show you. 
Uh, of course, the savings is how much you're going to be able to keep. You notice that you do get savings based on your current treasury. Uh, so if you see down here, current savings is 187,000 credits, and uh, you actually get 1% in savings interest each turn. Uh, research over here, uh, dig into that more in the in the research and stations video that I'll do in the future uh, that I'll be doing, but uh, setting up how much money you're going towards getting new technologies, either your main project or special projects or salvage projects. Um, so that covers things that happen on a turn-by-turn -turn basis, and you notice if you move one of these sliders, uh, especially over here on the government side, the other two are going to shift as well. Um, if you lock security though, that'll hopefully stick. So if you want to reduce stimulus, then you're going to add more to savings and vice versa. Let's look at the second row here where we've got our expenses. So these three boxes in the middle show your current invoices for ships, station invoices, and colony costs. So I don't have any of my colonies that are costing me anything. Um, when you colonize in the hazard rating, the economic or the uh, hazard rating is the higher the hazard rating, the more you're going to have to put into the colony to support it and keep it keep it up and running. So as you advance your colonies, um, they turn from cost uh, towards income. Invoices, uh, this is different from a lot of strategy games. You don't actually pay for something when you order it. You pay for it when it's built. So you notice I do have one ship that's listed here and it's blue. So this 59,600 for this uh, for this uh, police cruiser that's going to be built at Shoney is coming up next turn, so this is going to affect me directly. Invoices are not shown on the budget summary. Okay, These come above and beyond, so even though the budget summary shows that I'm using 100% of my income and actually generating some savings, uh, you'll note that the invoices are subtracted from that and you can actually go negative pretty quickly if you're building a lot of stuff. Um, I'll go into the design and build video uh, on, on the details of that. Um, but your stations as well, so building uh, modules, building stations also cost. Fleet maintenance, so the number of ships that you have out in the fleet, reserve versus active fleets, are going to cost you per turn. Station maintenance also costs per turn. So if you include the expenses, these per turn expenses, corruption we have to zero, there's no debt interest, so you actually have to pay 10% on debt when you have a negative, uh, when you have a negative savings or a negative treasury. Uh, you can get into a spiral pretty bad. Uh, so you take a look at that, so you take the expenses that we've got plus the invoices that we've got in the next turn, and that shows you due next turn. So we're almost 600,000 due in the next turn. Uh, we take that straight off of the million that we've got here, add all of these together basically, and you get the idea. So the security plus the stimulus, it comes out to your government number. The research is just straight one-to-one -one research number. Your expenses are here, due next turn, so it's your ongoing expenses plus your two invoices plus any colony costs. This trade income, this is the only point where you're going to see how much you're getting in trade. Um, one thing that I want to note, uh, you notice some of these numbers are green, uh, and I'll show you some red numbers as well. Green numbers means that they've increased turn over turn. Red numbers are decreasing turn over turn. So my trade income is increased since turn 66, so that's going up. So you bring all those things together, uh, how much you're spending on government, how much you're spending on research, how much you're spending on expenses, how much you're gaining in trade income, Add in the current savings to that from your total income, and it looks like we'll be uh, our projected savings next turn is going to increase. Last row down here, along with this summary, shows your colony summarizations. So I've got ten colonies in two provinces, and I'll show you about provinces shortly. Uh, shortly thereafter, there's a tax rate that you've got here, where you can set all the way from zero up to ten. Uh, five or six is kind of where you want to where you want to keep things at. Um, 
increasing the tax rate. It isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between morale and taxes, but as I'll show you when we get into the colony management, uh, morale is event-driven, and higher taxes, anything above six, depending on which race you are, depending on which government you are, depending on which faction you are, um, could negatively impact your morale turn-by-turn -turn basis. Um, whereas reducing it brings you in less money, but um, also will increase your morale. And then here's a kind of a nice breakdown of all of your colonies and how much they're bringing in. So you notice 5-5 and 5-3 are pretty new colonies. So are one, uh, new colonies as well, versus my home world, Suzel 2, which is coming in at over 600,000 a turn. Last thing you've got over here are just some other statistics of your empire as well. So total population, and again, green's good. That means it's increasing turn by turn. Biosphere, this is the total biosphere on all of your colonies. This is, it does impact your income slightly. Uh, biosphere does impact your income slightly, um, but it has a primary focus on your psionic powers. The average morale of all your colonies, again, to see that in the 80s and going up, is good. Uh, your rank of economy, so right now I'm number one in the uh, in the game out of three uh, the number of stations that you have or star bases that you have out there is 11 and then I've got 113 ships um, some or most of those are in active fleets but this also counts defensive ships as well ships in reserve too so um, that covers the entirety of the summary oh the last thing that we've got here uh, apologize for skipping over that piece. So due next turn are the invoices that are in blue, um, which is what's going to be built in the next turn. But if you add all of these invoices that are in gold, which will happen in future turns, then you see that the total financial commitments that I've got um, with the invoices are over a million. So I want to make sure that my income and my savings can handle that over time. As we see, we've got some bigger 125 building a new mining uh, station out at Karg. Uh, it's going to cost me 125 grand, another 50 grand to build a or to upgrade, build a naval station at Phi. So need to keep an eye on this number as well and make sure that you've got enough savings and income to handle that over time or else you're potentially getting yourself in a hole. Okay, uh, I think that covers the Empire Summary screen. So the next thing I want to take a look at from an Empire standpoint is how trade is handled. Trade is, can be very beneficial and it can be a great addition to the income that you've got. Uh, if we go back here to the Empire Manager, you notice that we're running at eh, maybe about 14-15% of my total income is, is coming in for trade. And I haven't done that heavily. Uh, I'm not forcing trade particularly and I'll show you uh, I'm doing it a little more organically with stimulus in the private sector as opposed to uh, running at Empire or running Imperial trade. Uh, trade is driven by c civilian stations. So in order to make use of trade, you need to have a civilian station within that particular system. So you'll notice the civilian stations are done by the dollar sign here. So you can see I've got quite a few civilian stations uh, out there within my systems. Uh, down here in the star map view mode, if you bring up the trade filter, this gives you a breakdown of how your trade is actually working. So trade is relatively easy. It's, there isn't a lot of micromanagement that you need to do. There is the potential capacity of goods that you have within the entire system. This is, you get an extra bubble for every 200 million, uh, 200 million population you have, plus an extra bubble per colony. So you notice these last two bubbles here represent my two colonies, and then the rest of this is the number of goods that I've got, that I've got incoming. Uh, that I that I can generate. Uh, actually, let me flip that around. I think it's yeah. Actually, the imports I believe is also the colonies. Anyway, it's it's based on population. So the amount of population you have is the amount of goods that you can generate, and the amount of imports that you can bring in. Um, Freighters is what takes those goods, so when you have the goods being generated and you have freighters taking the goods, that generates your, that generates your income. 
right? And then every good and freighter that is created here becomes an import somewhere else. Um, those connections aren't explicitly shown, but you can see up over here in Channer, we've got five goods that are actually being imported right off the bat. Coming back over to Suzel, so every, for every um, civilian station dock that you have, dock module that you have, is going to create one of these triangles here. And the triangles are filled in by including freighters. So you can, from an imperial standpoint, build the freighters yourself, and this is a ship that you're then responsible for. Um, you don't have to manage it on the battlefield, um, you don't have to direct it one place or another, but you do have to pay the expenses for it. And that's represented by any filled triangles that are your empire color. So this freighter right here, and up here in Parantar, this freighter right here, were both built by me. I uh, paid for them. Um, these other two freighters that we've got here, and these other three freighters here in Suzel, those are the actual civilian freighters. So when I showed you previously that you put some money into stimulus here, specifically around trade, then you're going to get a notification when civilian interests have actually built a, uh, built a freighter at a particular system. And those guys you never have to pay for in terms of actually building the freighter, and you don't have to pay maintenance either. Um, some of the bad things that happen though is if your morale goes down too far, then they're all going to bail on you. They'll go off to other systems or decommission themselves if your economic rating, which I'll show with the uh, colony management, goes down too low, they may, they may leave as well. Here's a little notification that we've got right there. So this civilian business interests have built a freighter in the Suzel system, so this fourth one right here. So in order to maximize your capabilities, then you need to focus the industrial output of your colonies towards generating these goods for interstellar travel. Um, so what you need to do is move this slider to show each of, to each of the sections to show your total capacity. Right, and then you can do it for multiple. Uh, you can do it for multiple worlds. So if I want this particular system to generate as much trade as I can, but then leave Suzel two, uh, only needing to bring up the other the other two uh, bits of goods here. So this is really all that you have to do. You just have to keep track of how many docks, uh, how many freighters that you have, and then match the goods to that and then that will maximize your trade capabilities. So I introduced a couple of concepts there that I kind of glossed over, but we'll dig into when we actually look at the colonies themselves. So let's take a look at Channer 5. So with the breakdown right here that you've got, uh, the most important statistics that you've got for the particular planets are the climate hazard and the size that you have. The size of the planet is going to set a top limit on the amount of population that you can put onto a planet. Population that you bring onto a planet is going to be directly related to the amount of taxes that you get or the amount of income that you generate from that planet. So the larger the planet, the more people go on it, the more people go on it, the more money you're going to make. Uh, if you take a look at Suzel, your home world is always going to be a size 10 planet. So you notice we've got a billion in imperial population and then a billion in over a billion actually in civilian population. This generates the huge amounts of income that you see right here. Suzel 2, as you notice, is just a size 3 planet, so it's got a maximum imperial population of 300 grand. Civilian population is building up towards that 300 grand, and you see that the income is a lot less. Going back here, uh, the type, there's specific types of planets, volcanic, magnar, things like that, that have some interesting effects on the game. You want to reference, uh, I believe, the manual or, uh, will, will tell you what those different things do. Um, resources. This is the sum total of industrial resources that are within that particular colony. So you're talking hydrocarbons, radioactives, trace metals, rare metals, energy capacity, all of those sorts of things. The resources is what's going to focus um, or have the greatest effect on your industrial output. Your industrial output is what you use to create ships, to build ships. The more industrial output you have, 
the faster you can build ships and it also this is the slider that you use the difference between construction and trade uh, biosphere already talked about that one um, that's going to have your overall effect in terms of your psionics um, I haven't created any psionic um, or researched any psionics so I don't have my overall psionic capabilities there um, a reference of the civilian population that you've got here there's also the breakdown here with imperial and civilian so again from a size standpoint for every size that the planet is you're going to have a uh, hundred million of imperial population and uh, it at the start a hundred million in terms of your uh, civilian population take a look at parentar here so this is three so you've got imperial population at 300 million civilian population at 300 million infrastructure right here this is a very important uh, point as well infrastructure represents the capacity that you have to actually translate the resources on the planet into industrial output and this is a percentage so it starts out at zero and when you colonize it starts to begin with and then increases over time if we go out here to phi where it's on the frontier and we've got some new planets here you'll notice that the infrastructure is growing because this is a relatively new colony that we've created so the construction that we're creating instead of going towards ships instead of going towards ships is actually going towards building more infrastructure so we move this slider all the way up here and we see that we're increasing the infrastructure on this planet by 1.64 per in the next turn this is a bit of a logarithmic scale so it looks like it's small right now but it'll be growing over time as more population comes on board um, as more people immigrate to this to this particular world that'll also increase the infrastructure rate so we're probably looking at maybe 10 15 turns before phi 3 uh, is completely uh, up and running with full in infrastructure and then full uh, civilians a full population things are moving a little bit faster over here on five five so this is a couple turns maybe five or six turns further along uh, and you see we're almost at or 39 percent infrastructure complete right now and continuing to grow um, let's break on down over here we'll go back to one of our other colonies one of our other uh, up and running colonies so I already mentioned that the income that's primarily a function of taxes that comes from your civilian population so more civilian population the more income you're going to get off of that uh, the economic rating this is a number from 0 to 100 that kind of shows the economic health of your particular colony um, there's actually a feedback loop between economic rating and your morale um, having a low economic rating will actually impact your morale negatively uh, and vice versa life support costs we're at zero climate hazards so there isn't going to be any life support costs that we've got again I also mentioned the construction trade slider and the markings in it to be to create goods if you've got a uh, a civilian station with free docks here um, this part down here over harvest is the capability to boost your output so you notice that the industrial output has increased quite a bit but we are using up resources 81 resources per turn so this will be 81 less than 3966 next turn if we do that so it's a quick way um, to boost things in terms uh, for for that kind of short-term game next thing to take a look at down here is morale so morale in sort of the stars is done by a colony by colony basis um, it's on a scale from 0 to 100 100 being the maximum and the best morale that you can have and this is affected turn by turn by events so particular events occur and that will impact your morale anything from combat to economic events to construction all of those things will either make your morale go up or make your morale go down so you notice if you hover over here uh, my by having an economic rating of 100 I'm increasing my morale by two per turn so um, they're happy the world is running at pretty much peak efficiency um, so they are increasing 
and they're, and they're very happy about that, that particular increase. Um, morale is important because once you start getting under 25% morale on a particular colony or system, um, then you're looking at the potential for rebellion. You're looking at the potential that people will be leaving um, your empire. Um, and their efficiencies go down. Uh, lots of bad things happen at that point. You notice that we've got a civilian population slider right here. It starts out set at 50. 50 is 50% 50 of the total max civilian population that you can put on this world um, will not impact your biosphere and will not impact your resources. If you want a boost, it's kind of similar to over harvesting that you see. You notice that I've got this one up to 100%. It's not impacting my biosphere right now but I've got twice as many civilians on, on there as I should, and that is impacting my resources. The red number means that we're going down, industrial input is going down, but you look at the income uh, is pretty high for, the, for that size of a, size of a world. So um, it's short-term gain versus long-term loss. Again, when you're playing a particular game, are you playing the long game or are you playing the short game? Uh, the, the boost that you get at the beginning might be helpful, but uh, as you go further and further along, this is gonna this is gonna bite you in the butt. So be careful with the sliders. Um, there's also some potential morale effects that you have around overpopulation. Um, things like that, that that occur. One of the nice things is, is that if you meet other races and you are uh, other factions and other races and you're able to get friendly with them uh, and keep things on your borders open and stuff like that, you can actually have those other races start to colonize your planets as civilians within your own particular empire. Uh, the nice thing about that is that they cover other areas. So for example, you know, the Tarkas, we like uh, particular templar, temperate or warmer climates, um, whereas the Lear will live in the oceans. So you can have more civilian population on a colony without that negative impact towards your resources or your biosphere. Let's see. Oh, I forgot mining. So uh, the mining piece, mining is done in Sword of the Stars 2 by creating mining stations. Mining stations don't impact your overall station uh, requirements. So you notice here at Parentar, I've got two station slots. One of them is taken up by a civilian station. But if we actually go into the system view and come out over here by the gas giant, you'll notice that I've built a mining station right here. What this does is it gives a boost to the uh, industrial output of a colony within this area. So you notice this little size four, uh, not that big of a world, but we've got over 7,000 industrial output uh, uh, occurring here. So this is this is due to uh, the resources that the mining station are bringing are bringing over. Um, mining stations do have a certain amount of maintenance costs that you have to watch out for, and of course they can be attacked and destroyed by by enemy forces or, or or randoms as well. So all that you need to do mining is just have uh, the technology, which is mega strip mining, which is in the which is in the industrial branch. So you do mega strip mining and that allows you to build mining stations basically around any any gas giant, any barren world, and also allows you to build them around asteroid fields as well. Um, if you build a mining station in a system that doesn't have a colony in it, then not the total amount of industrial output, but a fraction of that will be automatically transferred to the nearest colony. Um, so you want to put them in your own colony uh, or in your own systems that you own, but if you don't have any, for example, Suzel over here, I don't have any uh, gas giants or asteroids or barren planets, so um, I can't put any mining stations uh, in this particular area. Okay, I think that covers the overall government, or the overall uh, economics. Let's dig into government. Uh, so, I'll, oh, 
So when we look at government, one of the big things that you do to manage your government or your style of government is this button up here, which is the open system button. Um, what this can be looked at is kind of how you manage your borders. Um, do you allow your borders to be open or closed? So do people go through um, very, very tight scrutiny in order to be entered into the system? So you do management over, you keep out all the furners um, in terms of in terms of immigration. Um, civilian interests are not allowed within the system, so you can't have any uh, civilian freighters or mining stations or civilian colonies uh, within that particular system. Uh, so those are kind of the disadvantages, but the advantages are is that it's very easy, uh, it's very hard for your enemies to do intelligence operations against that particular, against that particular system. Um, uh, you don't have as much piracy occurring within the system, and that corruption level, uh, your requirements for security, uh, get reduced for each system that you create. So this minimum security that I've got right here, this this amount is the total requirement of the income that I'm bringing in uh, across. Uh, across the 10 colonies that I have since all of my colonies are open. There's also some fairly significant morale effects by closing a system. Um, it does negatively impact your morale depending on your government type more, more often more than other ones and then switching from a closed system to an open system will, will undo some of that damage. Um, other government things that we want to look at are provinces. So you notice that I've got these 10 colonies that I have scattered throughout seven systems. Uh, if we bring up the provinces view, you'll notice that these show kind of these political boundaries that we've got. So you automatically start out with your first three colonies within their own province. So I've got Dunashido here as my original province and then Dunsardo over here as my secondary province that I've built. And you notice Shoni's got the little star around it. So Shoni is the provincial or the provincial capital. Why do you want to add your, uh, why do you want to add your systems into a province? Um, it is a method of control. Um, it improves morale. Um, it improves trade, so trade between provinces makes a lot more money than trade within a particular province or to an independent or a non-provincial um, area. It reduces piracy, so uh, as you create trade, trade begets raiders and piracy. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to uh, putting your colonies into provinces. The disadvantage is, is that if you've got the entirety of a province goes into rebellion, uh, which is that 25 or less on morale, then you've got a flat out revolution. And that province will secede from your empire and become an independent AI controlled faction. Um, and then any fleets that have admirals that came from that province will actually make a loyalty check to see if they switch and their entire fleet moves over to the rebels as well. So um, there's a lot of advantages to it. There isn't a whole lot of risk unless you're really in trouble in terms of your morale. So um, advancing the capabilities of your uh, of your provinces are over here as part of the political science branch. So uh, you notice once you do the FTL economics, which allows you to start up trade, then going beyond that, you notice the next one is enhanced jurisdiction, which allows you to incorporate four star systems instead of three into a single province, and they can all be up to seven light years apart. So it increases your capabilities to bring more systems into provinces, which is, again, a good thing. Thing. Uh, only if you're in trouble uh, can you can you our province is bad for you so um, pay attention to that all right I 
think the last thing I want to show you guys is your overall government type. So in a lot of 4Xs, you've got uh, your government is something that you pick from a drop-down list. And then there are pluses and minuses that occur for you. Um, Sword of the Stars 2 tries something a little bit different in that you don't choose your government and then you get the pluses and minuses from it, but it's actually your actions decide which government that you're in. Um, at the beginning you start out here dead center on this graph and by your particular actions and you can scroll back all the way here to the beginning of when I built my first science station how those affect your shift on this governmental graph so economic liberalism is along the x-axis so you see this plus three economic liberalism moves me from the center towards the right um, Negative economic liberalism moves me back. So this is kind of a difference. There's there's a lot of subtleties, political subtleties that are included in this x-axis, but the general idea is money versus happiness. Um, money versus morale. Money on the left, uh, money on the right hand side, morale on the left hand side. Um, the y-axis that you've got is showing is authoritarianism. So this is uh, along the production and control versus more of the freedoms that you've got. So if you've got kind of a command economy, um, then you're looking up here at plutocracy. Um, so each one of these nine different areas have different pluses and minuses. The centrism is the bog standard. Uh, this is what you start out with and you notice you need to do quite a bit to actually shift you out over these borders either into some of the edge ones or the uh, in, in, into these edges. So it's really going to develop over time as you move. You see that I'm kind of moving towards authoritarianism and mercantilism um, in these particular directions. And then you can read about the particular diplomatic effects, uh, negative effects that it has on what you're doing. These are the pluses and minuses that you would usually get in a 4X if you'd pick democracy or something like that from your drop down list. Honestly, especially when you're starting out with this game, I wouldn't worry about this screen too much at all. Um, really, the idea is that you develop your play style, and your play style creates the government or moves you towards the government that you're playing as. Um, so if you're focusing on trade, if you're focusing on making money, and not particularly about being a warmonger or making people happy or things like that, then you're going to shift over to mercantilism, and then the positive and negative effects are going to affect you, uh, are going to reinforce what you've already done. So so, so it's it's not necessarily a system to be gamed, um, in, in my opinion, but it is something that's a different, you know, one of those unique things that Sword of the Stars does uh, that, that a lot of, uh, very few, I, I don't think any other 4X games do. So um, it's something interesting, it's something to keep an eye on in terms of your overall government. So hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Um, to dig into more stuff, there's plenty of information out there. Uh, check out the manual. It makes a good reference to keep up uh, when, when you're playing the game and you have particular questions, you know, doing a search on the online manual that you've got. Um, there's the forums out there. There's the wiki that I administer as well. And there's even the, uh, the global chat that we have uh, connected to the system now, the global IRC chat. If you've got any quick questions, there's usually uh, some active people people on there as well. Um, so good luck. Hopefully you enjoy the game and uh, we'll catch you guys later.